We begin this morning in this season of Advent with the word hope. What exactly is hope? Because hope can mean a variety of things to a variety of people. Webster describes in his dictionary the word hope is to cherish a desire with anticipation. To cherish a desire with anticipation. There's something within us that, that we're longing for and, and believe will someday come about, that's what we hold on to. That's our hope. And for some this morning, you, you feel like that the cards that you've been dealt, that, that hope is the only thing that you have to hang on to. And for some, you're holding on by a thread. For others, you feel like that your lot in life, that it, you look around at, at the situation and start evaluating things, and you say it's hopeless, that it's beyond change, that you're Tomorrow will look just like your today. That's why I like theologian Walter Brueggemann's definition of hope. He describes it as oracles of promise not rooted in or derived from the data or the circumstances at hand. These are things that we're longing for. So they're oracles at hand. They're things that we are looking forward to. They're rooted in Yahweh's circumstance-defined capacity to work to newness. That God's bringing about a change. God is going to make things new. So hope allows us to trust that God loves us no matter what. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. If you turn to the center of scriptures, you'll find Psalms and a couple books over, you'll find the book of Isaiah. In her book, All But My Life, Holocaust survivor Gerda Wiseman shares her journey as a 15-year-old girl separated from her family and forced to experience all kinds of atrocities in a German Nazi concentration camp. And she waited day after day to be rescued, to be set free, and, and hopefully reunited with her loved ones. But when her situation remained unchanged, something began to change within her spirit. Here's what she shared. My mind was so dull, my nerves so worn from waiting, that the only an emotionless vacuum remained. Have you felt that? You just felt empty inside because nothing is, is, is going to change. This, the, the help that you had hoped for and prayed for has not been brought about. So that's what she was going through. But in reality, the Lord was going to send help. There's one episode that, that changed everything for her. Gerda shared that one day when her and her fellow captives were standing at roll call for hours on end, about to collapse from hunger and fatigue, that they, they noticed over in the corner, they noticed something different. She said, we noticed in the corner of this bleak, horrid, and gray place that the concrete had broken and a flower had poked his head through it. And you would see thousands of feet shuffle every morning to avoid stepping on this flower. In reality, it was a tiny blossom of hope in which Gerda Wiseman was able to create this happy world that she was able to go to, a world of make-believe during those long years of loneliness. She shares, it helped me to survive this lovely world that was to be mine when the war was over. But in reality, Gerda and her fellow captives survived the second Jewish Holocaust. The first occurred in a different age before. The year was 700 B.C. And then the Jews had been fighting the dreaded Assyrians for over four decades. I just can't imagine. And their will to resist this particularly dreadful enemy and cruel enemy was just nearly depleted. Bill Hull, Bill Self, describes this awful time in history of God's people. He said, five times during these 40 years did the vast and superior Assyrian army stampede through the hill country of Israel, working terror and destruction wherever it went, with no regard for anyone's culture, with no regard for anyone's religion, and no regard for anyone else's life. They came like a scorpion plague, devouring everything and everyone in their path over and over and over the people of judah have been ravaged their horrid sounds of war were ever familiar the cries of pain seldom cease who could plant a field and have any hope that it would survive the harvest 
And who could bear a child with the confidence that it would reach maturity? It was a horrible 40 years, those years in which Isaiah lived. Well, the Assyrians had all but destroyed the nation of Judah, but ultimately it would be the Babylonian exile that would obliterate as a country. And the kingdom of, of Judah would be nothing but just a, a small remnant of people that Isaiah describes as a stump. That the, the great nation of Judah, if you can imagine, is this large tree in the forest that, that people have marveled and said, look at what God can do. And yet it's been cut down and all that remains is just a simple stump there to remind people of the way things used to be. And it appeared all hope was gone for this generation or any generation to follow. But Isaiah did not buy into the despair of his day. Instead, Isaiah spent his time expecting and waiting, hoping and praying. And finally, the word of the Lord came to his father, to his expected prophet. So we read together in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will will bear fruit. A stump of Jesse. Well, of course, that's talking about Israel's greatest monarch, King David. The the glory days that they would all remember and, and look back to, but those glory days are long since gone. It, it's just a, 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 dimmer, a, a mystery and, and just a folklore that they would pass on and, and talk about what it was like when David was on the throne. But now they're talking about that. But like Gerda Wiseman's flower, through this decaying cracks in his stump, a small shoot is coming up. There's growth, and this growth it is, is promised to be a new massive tree that's going to bear much fruit. And a king like no other kings, not just ruling over God's people, but ruling over all the nations, will be coming. Well, what would this king look like? If he's going to be the king of kings and lord of lords, how will his kingdom be ushered in? Isaiah 11 and verse 2 through 5 tells us, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, this new king, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Oh, he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or, or decide what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy, with justice it he will give decisions for the poor on the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness a sash around his waist. Are you getting an idea what, what this is going to look like? This new king? All these things that Isaiah is describing, the, the people are longing for. They're, they're longing for justice. They're, they're longing for righteousness. They're longing for the protection of God. So he's going to be this righteous and faithful and just king ruling over his people with compassion and understanding. So don't you know the people that are hearing this, this oracle of, of hope from, the, from Isaiah the prophet are just longing for this to come about. And when that day comes, his monarchy will bring order and healing, not just to the people, but to all of creation. Well, what will be the marks or the signs that this is, is coming about? Well, he tells us what it looks like in Isaiah 11, verse 6 through 9. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. And, and the calf and the lion and the yearling together. And the little child will lead them. The cow will, will feed with a bear. And the young will lie down together. And, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of a cobra. And the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. There will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord and the waters covering over the sea. So the blessings will not just be for, for God's chosen people, but all these things that are going to be coming and, and brought into fruition are not just going to be for Israel. We see in, in verse 10 that in that day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people and the nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. So can you imagine, if you've been experiencing for four decades the atrocities of these people coming in and just raping and pillaging and doing all these horrible things to God's chosen people, and he tells them, 
hold on. There's something growing. There's something stirring out in, in the forest. And out of this stump, there's growth happening. Although everything around us tells us contrary, God's saying, hang in there. Thump, something is about to happen. And this is one of the greatest statements of hope in all the literature. New growth out of this stump is going to be our Messiah, our Redeemer, the King of all kings is coming. And our tomorrow is going to be different than our today. So hope is based on our Heavenly Father and His promises and what He can deliver. And there's no other foundation on this earth to, uh, to build our, our foundation of hope upon. If you look at the financial markets, well, they, they go up and down and collapse. Governments rise and fall. And we see that all throughout Scripture, that, that, that the mighty tend to fall. But all throughout it, we see what God's been doing, God's truth continuing on in this story through all the ages. And that's the hope that keeps us alive. That's what we're hoping for, and that's what we're longing for, and that's what has been promised to God's prophet Isaiah. So even during the darkest of times, we can trust that God is in control. I love the famous quote of Carl Sandburg, his famous words that a baby is God's option, or is God's opinion that life should go on. Isn't that great? It's God's opinion that life should go on. And it's true. We think about it. A baby is a sign of hope. And during this season of Advent and, and Christmas, everyone looks to the baby in the manger to remind us that God is among us. God is with us. He's Emmanuel. He is here to make all things new, to make all things right. That's our hope. How else could Isaiah write about that the wolf will lie down with the lamb? And the leopard will lie down with the goat, and the child will lead them all, if not for this hope and this promise that we have in the baby in the manger here in Bethlehem. So what we see in this passage is circumstance-defying logic. Everything that is around us that we see that should be isn't in God's world. In our world, it, it doesn't make sense. But in God's world, the way it was originally created, we see it being restored to the way that God it created initially. So hope is trusting in God's love no matter what. You know, nothing is sadder than when hope dies. Resignation on behalf of people is just a sign that faith is beginning to, to close up within them. You know, resignation, you see it in people's life. And it's a great temptation this time of year for people to evaluate in, in this society what's going on and for people just to simply give up. John Jewell tells a story about a young woman named Virginia, 17 years old and pregnant, being sent to her 15th set of foster parents. Her case file read like a textbook example of neglect and abuse and bureaucratic failure. She sat there, Virginia alone in a chair, with her hands clasped on her lap, her eyes staring down at the floor. The foster parents had been made aware of, of her situation and Virginia's story, and that they were promised if they just take her for a little while, they'd make other arrangements for Virginia in the future. Well, finally, to break the ice, the foster mother asked Virginia a question, and she says, are you frightened? Kinda was her response without looking up. I've been in a lot of homes. Well, the sympathetic woman said to this frightened young woman to be, young mother to be, let's hope that this time turns out for the best. And then Virginia responded with one of those statements that just sticks to your soul. Without changing her tone or raising her eyes, she says, sometimes it hurts too much to hope. You know, I, I hope you never get to that point where it hurts too much to hope. I, I'm sure, though, that there are some here this morning that can relate with what she's talking about. You know, it's common knowledge within the medical community that within this time of year and the holidays, that it brings a sharp increase in those that experience deep amounts of depression, primarily due to people's unmet expectations of what the holidays should, or, or in their mind's eye, what they hope that they would be. So we, we have in our mind what, what life is supposed to be, but we're met with the reality and it doesn't add up. It brings about this sense of hopelessness and depression. I talked a few weeks ago with a friend of mine that's recently gone through a divorce 
with his wife of over 20 years. And I asked him, I said, looking back over this, this past year, what was the most difficult time? He said, hands down, it was Christmas Eve. He said he went to a sports bar to watch a, a football game and to get some food and take his mind off of his ex-wife and his four children. He said he was doing pretty good until halftime when a commercial came on that depicted a happy family around a Christmas tree on Christmas morning, all opening up their, their presents in joy. He said he just lost it. And there at the bar, just started openly weeping. The man to his right spoke up and says, let me guess, your first Christmas with joint custody. I said, yes. He said, welcome to our crew, and introduced him to other divorced fathers around the bar. You know, there's no deeper depression than that experienced by a person who cannot hope, who's, who's lost any desire or will to, to think about life being different tomorrow than it is today. And that's a very sad place to be in. That's why the words of Isaiah just thrill our hearts when we read about this. Because in the midst of a holocaust and all that they're experiencing, in the, in the midst of this national despair and devastation, I, Isaiah, led by the Holy Spirit, calls the people together and says, something's happening, something's growing, God's at work here. It may not uh, appear by what's happening around us, but there is hope on the horizon. And so he dared to envision a day when God's reign would be over all. And he dared to envision a day when a shoot of new life would burst forth and grow into this massive tree that would bear fruits of goodness and righteousness for God's people and the nations. When the one from God shall reign triumphant. You know, in, in a world of, of pain and defeat, where might often overrules and determines what's right, where the worst sometimes crowds out the best, we had the Bethlehem baby there, God's flower that's coming up from the pavement, right? You know, the cruel throne of, of Herod was there in the background, and you have the, the ruthless empire of Caesar there in Rome serving as a backdrop for this tiny manger and this baby placed in it there in Bethlehem in Judea. But if you look back on, on the course of, of history, it may have seemed hopeless at that moment, but now we have the benefit of, of looking back and knowing that, that Herod and, and Caesar are, are but just people in, in a history book. But now we have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords reigning on high. We know how the story ends. It may have loomed large at the time, but that simple manger would provide hope for all of time. You know, in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a glorious banner for all peoples, and the nations will be rallied unto him, and the resting place will be glorious, is what it talks about. What about for you and me? How does this story of hope impact each one of us? Well, I, I think it impacts us in three ways. First, it allows us to look back and, and, and the past is important for us because our hope first is based on God's faithfulness, what he's done for us, and what we can read about. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 10, it says, We have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men. We know that this child grows up to be a Savior. We know that he willingly went to Jerusalem and was nailed upon the cross and was put in, into the tomb and was raised three days later. We know, we believe, we hold on to these events of the past where God has been faithful, where God has intersected God's family and has been there for them. But our hope is not just rooted in past events. It also shapes what we're doing right now in our present lives. Romans 15 and verse 4 says this, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope right now. It, it changes us. And, and so this becomes something deep within us that our external circumstances are not going to override. They're not going to trump. It can't be taken away from us. No matter what happens, our ups and downs in life, that hope is central to who we are and that defines who we are as a people and therefore how we live out our days. You know, finally, our hope is expecting as we talked about earlier in the drama, it's longing for the day of Christ's return. Romans 8 and verse 22 says this, we know that the whole creation has been groaning 
as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So what has been, the work that's been given to us, and, and we partner with our, with our Savior Jesus in the waters of baptism, and participate in the death, burial, and resurrection, we're given a gift of the Spirit that starts this transformation, that starts this thing that won't be fully completed until Christ's return. And that's what we're longing for. That becomes a time when we become whole and become perfect like our, our Heavenly Father's Son, Jesus. And that's what we hope for. And that's what Christmas is all about. You know, we can enjoy the, the trees and the lights and the decorations. But we can enjoy all of the the time singing Christmas carol and our time around the table with family and friends and going to parties and even the giving and the exchanging of gifts. We can enjoy all that, but we have to remember and not lose sight of the story, the Christmas story, the hope that comes from Jesus Christ. You know, if you find yourself this morning going through a time of struggle, I just encourage you, don't give up. Don't give up. Hang in there. Lift your eyes from your sorrow to your Savior. And, and lift your eyes from, from your misery to the manger because that becomes the hope of our salvation. You know, hope is our flower in each one of our lives. It's breaking through that pavement and coming up. Hope is that tender shoot coming from the old decaying stump there in the woods, Jesse's stump. It's that tender shoot promising new life. And hope comes in the form of a child lying there in the manger. That's what we have. That's our hope. And Scripture tells us that hope will not disappoint. At the conclusion of her book, Gerda Wiseman ends with this charge. She says, remember the past to make a better future. Always have hope and never give up. This morning, if you find yourself in a hopeless situation, or you have hope, but you're hanging by a thread, our, our shepherds want to talk with you. They'll be available off to my right in this lobby to your left. They want to hear your story, and they want to marry that with God's story and remind you of the hope and promises that are given to us in Scripture, promises that God will be there with us and never give up. You know, certainly the waters of, of baptism are always available Come talk with me. We'd love for you to start your journey of hope this morning, your story with Jesus Christ. The season of Advent is here and reminds us to remember the baby born in Bethlehem in Judea. Hope allows us to trust in God no matter what.